This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 44 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the Homestead Journey. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, once again, thank you. Thank you for being here and being a part of the listening audience. And today I wanted to give a special shout out to my coworker Bill, who happened to walk up to me this week and he said, from beak to butt. And I said, ah, oh, you found the podcast. So Bill, uh, thank you very much for listening and for stopping by this week and for chit-chatting with me. And uh, hopefully uh, you will continue to find this podcast helpful and um, hopefully I'll be able to learn from you. Bill was sharing with me how he and his wife actually have really gotten into foraging for uh, mushrooms, in particular morel mushrooms. And uh, that's something that I have not gotten into but have an interest in. And so um, I, I'm sure over the next uh, uh, little bit I'll be picking Bill's brain. Um, so be forewarned, Bill. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, it was just, it was really, really cool to have that, uh, kind of that random connection come out of, out of nowhere. And, uh, so very, very cool. Anyhow, let's jump right into this week's Homestead Happenings and I will bring you up to speed with what we've had going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead. It has been a busy week here on the homestead with the garden. It's just that time of the year, and the garden is really starting uh, to kick into overdrive. And so I've spent some time up there and, well, some time here in the house doing things as a result of what's going on in the garden. Our tomatoes have really finally started coming on. It took a little bit. And as I've talked to friends of mine and, and my, my dad in particular, and I was actually at a function on Friday, was talking to some uncles uh, who are avid gardeners who have gardened for many, 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 many years. And they were saying that their tomato harvest in our in, in, in this area has been uh, slow in, in coming on. So that made me feel a lot better about myself. I guess misery likes company. <laughs> uh, but uh, finally, this week, our tomatoes have kicked it into gear. And in fact, as I was talking to them on Friday, um, both of my uncles that I was I was talking to about their gardens uh, said that uh, their their tomatoes actually haven't even started coming on yet. Um, I think my uncle Dave said they've gotten two tomatoes at least as of Friday. They'd gotten two ripe tomatoes, um, and they live oh maybe less than an hour away from me. So it's been a bit of a tough year for for everybody. Uh, it's been a little dry, been been um, just just an odd year beyond the whole COVID thing. <laughs> twenty twenty has been a bit of a challenge, I guess, for gardeners with much more experience and much more talent than I have. But this week, our tomatoes did really kick into gear, and uh, our peppers started coming on this week. And so tomatoes and peppers, and as you recall, I pulled my onions last week. Tomatoes, peppers, and onions, what do you got? Salsa. And so we did up a batch of salsa this week. And it was very, very exciting because with the exception of the garlic and the cilantro, um, everything in that salsa came right out of our garden. The peppers, the onions, the tomatoes. And that's just something that's very, very satisfying. Uh, my hope is that next year the garlic will be out of my garden and the cilantro should have been out of my garden except I kind of dropped the ball on getting my cilantro started. So uh, hopefully next year it will be 100% from our garden. But uh, hey, at, at least the bulk of it came from our garden. That's very, very exciting. So we did some salsa this week and uh, then we canned up a lot of tomatoes. In fact, right now my wife is babysitting the hot water bath canner 
We have uh, a full canner load of tomatoes in in the hot water bath canner that she's keeping an eye on and a few more quart jars of tomatoes to go in when those are done. So that's just very satisfying. And we we don't really do a lot with the tomatoes from the standpoint of, besides making salsa, I don't make spaghetti sauce or pizza sauce because I've really found over the years that I don't care a lot for red sauce on my spaghetti. I'm not somebody who likes lasagna that much. I don't care for uh, even spaghetti and meatballs. If if I mean, I'll eat it. But if my wife makes spaghetti, I would much rather put butter and Parmesan cheese on my spaghetti than have red sauce. Um, and you go to, you know, a potluck, although right now potlucks are kind of few and far between. But a lot of times you go to a potluck and that baked ziti is kind of the uh, the dish of the potluck. And I just don't care for things like that. I don't I don't know why it is. When I was younger, I liked them. And uh, it's just gotten to be where, I don't know if it's the acid in it, but anyhow, because of that, we don't make pizza sauce and spaghetti sauce and things like that. We just have a tendency to can tomatoes in chunks. We raw pack them and then my wife will use them to make soups and stews. And one of the things I absolutely love is she will make a killer. It's absolutely wonderful. Goulash. Now, it's funny. Here I am. I'm saying I don't like red sauce. And then I I say I love this goulash. Uh, folks, I've given up trying to figure it out. <laughs> you like what you like, I guess. But uh, she'll make this goulash using the sausage that we get from um, when, when we take our pigs to have them processed. So it's our own sausage and, and our own tomatoes, and it's just out of this world. She also makes the Swiss steak that is just killer. It's in the Instant Pot, and uh, the, the Swiss steak, onions, and some beef, and you put that over potatoes, and whoo, oh my goodness, it's some good eating. Mm. And uh, when we were raising rabbits, she would also do a stewed rabbit with uh, the, the uh, canned tomatoes of ours. So just very, very versatile. And I don't put a lot of spices into it because then, you know, you're, you're not backing yourself into a corner, so to speak. So we just can up a lot of tomatoes every year. And so we're in the process of doing that right now. And uh, that's just really, really exciting. Also, because of the cherry tomatoes that are coming on, I've had the dehydrator running this week. I also ran some peppers through for the first time. We'll see how those um, work out for us. And something else that I did, I was going to throw the tomato skins away, and I had somebody recommend that we dehydrate the tomato skins. What they do, they said, is they take those tomato skins, they grind them up and make a tomato power up, a tomato powder, and they use it for seasonings and stews and, and soups and things like that. But they said where they really, really like it is they really like it in rice. And we eat a lot of rice. My son loves rice. We eat probably as much rice as we eat potatoes. And so, going to give it a whirl. You know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So I've been dehydrating tomato skins and need to grind those up. Uh, and so it's just been that dehydrator is, uh, we, we've been putting it through its paces. I, in fact, I've got more cherry tomatoes that as soon as I'm done recording and editing this podcast tonight, I'll be cutting some cherry tomatoes in half, loading that puppy back up and turning it on and uh, dehydrating some more cherry tomatoes. The last thing that we have been doing is uh, canning beans. Um, my beans aren't coming on fast and furious whereby I'm running you know, 19 pints at a time. I'm canning five, six pints of bean at a whack. It's just steady. And so far, I think we're over 50 pints of beans. Now, we can our beans in pints because it's just the three of us. And uh, that's just a perfect amount for a meal. I know a lot of people have it. Uh, they'll, they'll can in quarts their beans. But for us, a pint of beans is enough for a meal. And so that's what we do. Now, yesterday, we also did our annual corn thing. <laughs> I guess we'll call it a corn party. We buy a hundred years uh, from a local family. Actually, my mom and dad buy a hundred years. We buy a hundred years. We get together on a Saturday 
and we blanch and cut it off the cob and we freeze it and it's just become an annual tradition and I absolutely love doing it and it's just an absolute blast to do that together as a family. My dad and I will be outside, we'll be husking, my son will be running the the corn in, my mom and my wife are blanching it and cutting it off the, the uh, cobs and then once my dad and I are done husking, uh, my dad actually had, had to go to work yesterday, so I came indoors, and then at that point, I'm running the blanching operation, and my, my wife and my, my mom are cutting it off the cob, and uh, then I'm running corn cobs out to the pigs and to the chickens and stuff like that, and it just works out really, really well, and it makes for great memories. But one of the things that we added to our memories <laughs> is I made corn cob jelly. I happen to read about corn cob jelly and I'm all about trying to use every bit of, of whatever. I, I, I want to avoid as much waste as possible. Now, one of the beautiful things about having pigs and chickens is that you can turn a lot of stuff into bacon and eggs. But if I can use these things in a way that makes sense and it's practical, I'll give it a whirl. And I happened to run across this week this idea of corn cob jelly. I had never heard of such a thing. I said, you know what? Let me give it a whirl. And so I made a batch and I liked it so much I made a second batch. And it really what you do is you just cook the corn cobs. You, you put a couple of quarts of water in them, you boil them down, and then you take the corn cobs out, you strain that liquid um, through uh, a sieve or a uh, through cheesecloth, and then you take that liquid, put in some pectin, put in some sugar, and you end up with this jelly. And to me, it reminds me a lot of honey. And there's a lot of people that say that it reminds them of honey. I don't really taste a lot of corn in it. It just tastes to me a lot like honey. And I'll put a link to in the show notes to the recipe that I used. Um, but it was, it was a lot of fun. And uh, that was something new that we did this week. Finally, this week, my freeloading pullets started laying eggs. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's been since March I've been feeding those little beggars. It's about time they start pooping out some breakfast. And so this week, we finally got our first pullet eggs. Now, uh, to be fair, I think they may have been laying around uh, the area where they're at. There's a lot of rocks, and so they may have been laying on the rocks, and the eggs were getting broken. And as you may recall from last week's episode, my son and I, uh, Brian, Jay, and I hung the nesting boxes finally in the mobile chicken coop. And so they've started laying in there. And so that's very, very exciting. Hallelujah. We have pullet eggs. So it was a great week here on the homestead. A lot of things going on and uh, just starting to see our hard work uh, paying off with the produce from the garden and starting to be able to fill up the pantry for the long winter that is ahead. I hope things are well on your homestead, but that's what's been going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. As you may recall from last week's episode, I'm putting together a little bit of a shop, an Amazon shop of things that we use here on our homestead. And you can find that the homesteadjourney.net slash shop. Uh, if you're interested in checking that out, there are affiliate links through Amazon. So anything that you click there does help support the show. But as I've been putting together those links and thinking about the, the things that we use here on our homestead that I would recommend, I really started thinking about homesteading tools. And as I was thinking about homesteading tools, I, I, I kind of went down this rabbit hole of, well, what constitutes a tool? Is my tractor a tool? Are five-gallon buckets a tool? Is baling twine a tool? Are my all-American canners tools? What about shovels and rakes and pitchforks and wheelbarrows and wagons? And Well, what is a tool? And as I've been thinking about that, I thought, well, you know, it would be fun to put together an episode that's really focused on Maybe the hand and power tools, we'll put it in that category, although there is one item that's on the list today that really perhaps doesn't fall into that category, but hey, 
whatever. I'm going to put it on there anyhow. But I, I started thinking about hand and power tools that we found helpful here on our homestead and that these are tools that I find myself reaching for over and over and over again. And maybe in many cases, they're tools that I have found uses far beyond the reason why I bought them in the first place. In some cases, these are tools that I actually resisted buying for, in some cases, many years. And in part, that's just simply because I'm a cheapskate. All right, I'll be the first one to admit it. I am an absolute cheapskate. But as part of this, as I was thinking about this week, I also tried to think about tools that I feel like are tools that almost every homestead will find useful. And so that's, you know, if, if you wanted to make the argument for a tractor, and obviously I said I'm talking about, I'm going to focus on 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 power tools and 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 hand tools but just kind of going back to the tractor for a little bit not every homestead is going to need a tractor and so obviously that doesn't fall within the parameters that I've set for myself and so these are tools that I I found very helpful here on 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 our homestead and I think that you might find them helpful on your homestead now I obviously kind of skipped over the, well, I, I skipped over the obvious things like screwdrivers and hammers and shovels and rakes and pitchforks and so on and so forth. Now, I actually did, <laughs> I did consider putting a snow shovel on this list. And the reason being is that we have actually found that a snow shovel, we have a plastic snow shovel that has a metal, I guess you would call it a, a bar or tooth on it, that we have found to be the most effective tool for cleaning out our chicken coop. Go figure. A snow shovel. But I resisted the temptation, and so a snow shovel is not on this list. Now, I'm sure that after I get done recording this episode... And as I think about this over the next week, there's going to be other tools that come to my mind and I'm going to be kind of like kicking myself. Why in the world didn't you put that on the list, you knucklehead? <laughs> and so maybe, who knows, maybe in the not too distant future, there will be a part two to this. And I certainly would love to hear from you as to the tools that you have found invaluable on your homestead, because I'd love to learn from you. And maybe there's tools that you have found that have been invaluable that I will then say, hey, I can't live without this. And that will become a part of part two. But anyhow, in no particular order, we're going to jump into this list of my most useful tools here on 3B Farm and Homestead. The first thing that comes to my mind is my DeWalt toolkit. It's the 20 volt battery powered toolkit and I resisted buying these tools for years and years and years. I got by with an El Cheapo uh, Black & Decker drill that came as a part of a, a multi-tool kit that I got for a Christmas present. And I used that drill for, like I said, years and years and years to the point to where the chuck was so boogered up on it, I would have to put it in my vise in order to be able to change bits. And yet I, I insisted on using that for a long time that way because I am a cheapskate. But a couple of years ago, actually it was last year, we did a bathroom remodel. And I said, you know what, I need to have a good drill and I need to have, um, there were some other tools that I wanted to have. And, uh, and so I bought this DeWalt toolkit. I bought the four piece kit. I'll, I'll link to it. I'll put links to as many of these tools as I can in the show notes. Um, and this was the kit that came with, it was the impact driver, the drill, the light and a sawzar. A mal, I call it a sawzar. I, I can't remember what they call it. A, a reciprocating saw. That's the generic term. I guess the sawzaw is a brand name. But anyhow, uh, that's what it came with. And th then I think Lowe's was running a, a deal at the time where you could get another tool. And so I chose the um, circular saw. 
So that's what I started out with. Now, the funny thing was, is when I bought that, I thought I would use the drill. I wouldn't use the impact driver and I would use the, the reciprocating saw um, and I would never use the light. But the light came with it, so it is what it is. Folks, the tool that I have used the least out of that kit has been the drill. I use the impact driver all the time, and part of it just because you can get it in places that the drill can't get into. And uh, I use a reciprocating saw a lot. And I've actually even found that the flashlight is helpful. But then I moved beyond that. I bought a grinder. I bought the oscillating tool, which is just, I mean, that, again, I thought I, I would use that once or twice and I found so many uses for that thing. It's just absolutely hysterical. But it's just really been a very, very invaluable tool when I'm out needing to repair things or I'm wanting to build things. Uh, having that toolkit has been an absolute... I was like, how in the world have I, have I lived without you guys? for all of this time. Now I know some people are Milwaukee fans and some people are Porter Cable fans and 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 quite frankly I don't I I'm I obviously bought into the DeWalt family and so I'll be a DeWalt guy at least for for the the duration but uh having a good set of cordless tools I have found to be invaluable here on our homestead. The second tool that came to my mind and this one kind of cracks me up, but it's a pair of, they're called tinner snips. Um, it's kind of like a large pair of, of, of scissors. And I think they're originally, well, tinner snips, they're originally designed to cut tin. But I use those things to cut baling twine. I use those things to cut hardware cloth. I use those things to cut tin. I use those things to cut wire when I'm out uh, running electric fence. I have just found so many uses for those stupid tin tin snips. It's just hysterical. And it, it's kind of frustrating because right now I've I, I've misplaced my 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 uh, pair of tin snips. In fact, I left them in the pig pen one one day and they got kind of got buried and then I found them like a year later and they were all rusted up. And by that point I had already gone out and bought another pair. And so I'll probably end up going out to buy another pair here in the not too distant future because I have found them to be extremely versatile and extremely useful. In fact, if you follow us on Facebook or Instagram, you may remember from back in the spring that I was using a uh, baling twine to put together the um, the squares for my square foot garden. And what I will do is I will come behind with those snips and just cut off the excess twine that I have left over. I just use them so much and they're just a really, really handle, handy thing to have around. And when I, I don't have them, I can't find them. It's just so frustrating. But it's tinner snips, and and again, I, I abuse them, I'm sure. I mean, I use them to cut the bottoms out of feed sacks and just so many things. I love those things, and, and it really bugs me that I can't find them right now. So I may just go buy myself another pair. I'm sure as soon as I go buy, I go buy another pair, I will discover where I laid them down. That's one of the things that I'm really, really bad about. It's like confession, I guess, time here on this podcast episode. But I am always, like when I do a project, I spend half the time wandering around looking where I put my, my tools down. I'm horrible about that. But anyhow, that's not what this episode's about. So if you had any to, uh, any tips on how I can get better on that, I'd really love to hear them. But um, but tinner snips, love them. Uh, the next thing on my list is a, a craftsman toolkit that my brother Eric gave me. I don't even know how long ago. It's in a zippered case and it has a couple of, uh, box and wrenches. It's got some, um, ratchets. It's got a ratchet. It's got some drive sockets. It's got, a a handle for a screwdriver and some bits and it has some Allen wrenches. And folks, just about everything that I ever need for any project that I'm working on is in that case. If I if I need to, you know, work with, with bolts, that that's that's the thing that I pull out. It's just it is extremely, extremely handy. Now I'm gonna put a link to one that's similar uh, in the show notes. 
it, this is not the exact one that I have, but it's very similar to it. And this is the Craftsman Evolve, which I think is kind of their budget line now. So, you know, I, I don't know. Um, if, but it'll just give you an idea of what I'm talking about. And again, folks, it has just been something extremely handy when I'm working on my tractor or when I'm working on the car. It's got metric. It's got, you know, the, the standard size. Um, drivers, it is just been extremely, extremely helpful. One of the best presents I ever got in in my life. It's just been extremely handy to have that thing around. It's just this little itty bitty case that I can carry around with me, and I absolutely love it. The next tool on my list is a vice grip, and I think it's called a quick adjusting groove lock V jaw plier, which I know is a mouthful. But uh, those pliers have been, again, something that have been extremely versatile for me. And if you look at, again, I'll have a link in the show notes. If you look at how the, the jaws are oriented on them, it just makes it so that it grabs a hold of things a lot better than just regular adjustable pliers do. It, it just seems to have a lot better grip. And I use those things for so many different things from putting in fences to just so many different things. I absolutely love those adjustable pliers. The next thing on my list is a chop saw. Now I have a chop saw that I picked up at a yard sale a long time ago. And it actually, somebody had built a table that the chop saw is bolted to. But that chop saw, oh my goodness, how in the world did I live without that thing? When you are building coops or you're building chicken tractors or you're, I mean, building almost anything, having a chop saw with a stand is absolutely invaluable. Now, I know a lot of people have, or I should say a lot of people, but I see a number of people who do YouTube videos have the DeWalt uh, chop saw with the the base, and that looks awesome. And the, the downside to the base that I have is it's made out of like uh, four by fours and plywood, so it's just heavier than a dead preacher, and I don't really move it around much in my garage. So I, I would love to have something that's a little bit more portable, but boy, a chop saw. If you don't have a chop saw, you need to buy a chop saw. Um, being able to do 45s and to be able to do just so many different things uh, is just invaluable. And it makes building things so much quicker and so much easier. And when you're using the chop saw versus using a circular saw, you're sure that your cuts are going to be square. Now, yes, you can use a square to make your cuts square. And, and I do that when I'm using my circular saw. But just having that chop saw makes things so much easier. And I absolutely love my chop saw. Now, the next item on my list was one that I was, I wasn't quite sure whether or not I was going to put it on. I kind of went back and forth. And that's a T-post driver. All you use them for is to drive T-posts. But folks, having a T-post driver, if you're doing any kind of fencing, a T-post driver is going to set you back 35 bucks or something like that. It is well worth it. Don't try to drive T-posts with a sledgehammer. Buy a T-post driver. Now, if you're going to drive... If I was going to put in a, a much more fence than what I've gotten, I would buy one of those gas-powered T-post drivers. Because where I'm at, we're on a bunch of shale, a bunch of rock, and it's a, it's literally a pain in the neck to use that manual. T but I can't even imagine trying to do T-posts with a sledgehammer. Oh my goodness, that would kill me. I would be so dead right now. Um, but a T-post driver, it's, it is just, if you're putting T-post in, you want a T-post pounder or T-post driver. They are the, they're just the next best thing since sliced bread, especially over trying to, to do it with a sledgehammer. That's just insanity. So T-post driver, if you're doing T-post, get a T-post driver. Even if you're doing, if you're just driving one T-post, buy a T-post driver, all right, or borrow one, but they're amazing. I love them. The next thing on my list is 
relatively new to my homestead, and that is a pancake air compressor. Now, depending on what you're going to use the air compressor for, you may want to go a step above a pancake air compressor. Um, but I had not had an air compressor on my homestead for a long, long time. And then it was about a year ago, maybe it was two Christmases ago, maybe it would be two Christmases ago this coming year. Um, actually my wife bought me one and my father-in-law bought me one for Christmas. And that's actually how I ended up with the DeWalt tools because I took the one that my wife got me back and I, and I used the money from that to buy the DeWalt tool set. But having that pancake air compressor around is just been, again, it's just one of those things that you, you, you have it now all of a sudden it's like, how in the world did I live without it? From using it to, uh, put up, uh, what the ceiling in my bathroom using, uh, you know, the, the nail gun, um, the stapler when you're putting together a, a chicken tractor instead of trying to use, a hand stapler and just ended up with carpal tunnel because <laughs> those staple guns just don't work well. I mean, it's just amazing. And then obviously being able to actually take care of my, my tires correctly, um, and, and, and maintain air, comp you know, the, the, the pressure in my tires the right way. Uh, but having a, a, an air compressor of some sort, and for many people, I think probably a pancake air compressor is going to be a good place to start. Uh, but it has just been an invaluable tool here on the homestead. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about, this is a bit of a stretch. I'll, I'll admit it. This is a bit of a stretch to include this in tools. And yet, I, I don't know how I lived without one of these especially when I am planting my garden. And that is a work apron. Now, I, I discovered a work apron for homestead use by watching Justin Rhodes' uh, channel. And that was the first time. I, and, and I kind of went back and forth on it. With, you know, it was kind of like, is that just a shtick? Is he, you know, rocking the apron just kind of like this? <laughs> and, it, you know, I, I mean, it was the first, when I first discovered his his channel is like you know is this kind of wannabe hipster farmer guy and so he goes out and buys this work apron and and you know it's kind of just this shtick but I bought and folks I absolutely love having a work apron when I am working on projects when I'm working on fencing having you know the the apron there where I can have the the clips and the tools and when I'm out planting the garden I can actually put like my my seeds in in a pocket and I use um the tongue depressors or craft sticks as my as my markers and I'll have a marker to write on my markers <laughs> and all of that having that work apron has just been absolutely amazing and in particular for someone like me who works a day job and sometimes I'll come home and I want to get a project in, you know, maybe in the hour that I have for lunch and I don't want to run upstairs and change my clothes. I can just throw that work apron on and go out and do something really quick and protect my work clothes. Uh, and, and that work apron has just been absolutely invaluable. So though the one that I have, they no longer sell the one that my wife and son have, they no longer sell, I'll try to find a comparable one and put a link up just so you can kind of see um, what I'm what I'm talking about. So those are the tools that come to my mind that are just my must-haves. Those are the kind of the things that if I were to lose them or they were to break, I would go out and buy them again in a heartbeat. My DeWalt toolkit, those tin snips, my Craftsman toolkit, those vice grip groove lock V-jaw pliers, the chop saw, my T-post driver the pancake air compressor, and of course that work apron. What are some of the tools that you use that you love? I'd love to hear from you. Brian at thehomesteadjourney.net, drop me a line, or you can reach me on Facebook, Instagram. Um, we're on YouTube as well. Send me a message, and I would absolutely love to hear from you. And uh, maybe there's something that you're using, just like that work apron that I discovered from Justin Rhodes. Um, maybe there's something you're doing that can make my life easier and I would absolutely love to hear that from you.
All right, that's it for this episode. If you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you jump on over to iTunes and leave us a review or whatever it is, whatever is your favorite podcast player. Uh, Give us a thumbs up, a review, a like, whatever they allow. Uh, If you haven't already, please subscribe so that you're notified anytime that we release an episode. Generally speaking, it's going to be on Mondays every week, but uh There's been a few times when I've been very benevolent and released an extra episode, and so you definitely don't want to miss those, so make sure you subscribe. If you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you'd share the show with friends and family, people that you think might benefit uh, from this, might enjoy it. And uh, if you'd like to support the show, as I said earlier, we do have the homesteadjourney.net slash shop uh, set up. And so if you go there and look at those affiliate links, there may be something that interests you and anything that you buy through there would help support the show. Uh, we're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. Give us a like, a follow on those platforms. Uh, I'd really appreciate that. And that'll help you keep up to, uh, with with what we're doing on a day-to-day basis here on the homestead. The music, as always, for this episode is provided by Audionautics.com. Big shout out to them and a big thank you to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.